So uh, we're going to continue in the theme that we're going on, which is about resurrection, just uh, celebrated the resurrection last Sunday, yes? And we were talking about it's going to happen. It's going to happen three times in the book of Matthew. Uh, Jesus predicted his own death and resurrection. And uh, he was telling his disciples, this is what's going to happen. Okay? And he didn't actually even just say that three times. He said it several times. We know from, for example, the Gospel of John uh, that he said, destroy this temple. He said it to the priest, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up. I will build it up again, three days. And the disciples never really understood and never really connected with what he's saying. They didn't like it. But then here comes Resurrection Day, and they started seeing, oh, it has. So last Sunday, uh, David preached and told us, it's not going to happen anymore. It has happened. And yet, uh, you know, it's not, it's not the end of the story. You would think Jesus raised from the dead, done deal. We all now believe in his resurrection. We all know that this is the truth. Yeah? No. Read with me. Matthew 28, Matthew 28 and from verse 16, if you would stand up and read the word of God together. So from verse 16, and it says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And then they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always. To the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I'm sorry that you didn't understand that. I'm, it's my bad English, but it will come. <laughs> uh, there was a phone going on. Anyway, Siri was asking a question. Uh, David wanted... Uh, wanted, you know, this Sunday to, that the whole passage would be preached on. But actually, here is the problem. He paid me so little. <laughs> he did. And so I'm going to preach only on one word from that whole passage. I know Carl said we're going to talk about the Great Commission. I'm just, he paid enough for one word. <laughs> here is the word. They doubt. If you think about it, Jesus kept telling, I'm not going to say the disciples, kept telling us, he's going to die, he's going to rise up again. And we didn't like it. And uh, so he said again and again. He even took three of us and went on the Mount of Transfiguration, or the Mount that now we call the Mount of Transfiguration. And his, his shape, everything changed in front of the very eyes of the leaders of that whole group, Peter, James, and John. And still, we didn't believe. They even didn't believe. Now, Jesus rose from the dead and now the women are going to do a ritual. They bring uh, a few herbs and spices, you know, very uh, floral, fragrant herbs with uh, some form of what you would call maybe wax or gum. And they mix them together and they envelop the whole body with that. This is why they were going on Sunday morning. Okay? Have you noticed? They're going because Jesus is dead. 
and they're hoping for someone to roll the stone to open the tomb so that they can perform that ritual because it would be honoring as well to Jesus. But this is what you would do to a dead person. And the passage, if you go at the beginning of, of chapter 28, says that, you know, an angel came down and lightning and bright lights and even his, his clothes are like bright white and and not just rolled away the stone, sat on it. And, and the soldiers, strong Roman soldiers, okay, they fell as if dead from fear. And God gave grace to the four women, maybe more, okay, actually not to be that afraid. And then they heard an angel saying to them, why are you looking for Jesus here? He wouldn't be amongst the dead. He rose. He rose as he said. But have you noticed that Mary Magdalene later on was still looking for Jesus? And she saw a man. She thought he is the gardener. And she asked him, look, if you took him, tell me. Just tell me. Not just the women. Uh, they went afterwards because... Jesus spoke to them. They went and told the disciples. So Peter and John ran towards the tomb. They too heard from angels. Okay? Why are you looking for him here? They saw the cloth that Jesus was wrapped in, folded and put there. If someone took Jesus, they won't take the cloth off and unwrap it and fold it and put it down. Yeah? And they went back. Ah, oh, amazing. We don't know what happened. You have angelic powers, angelic beings telling you he rose. We don't know what happened. You have the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And uh, I love them. I think I'm, I'm thicker than they are. But anyway, so I have hope. But they walked with Jesus for 11 kilometers, that's seven miles, okay? Getting the best Bible study ever, <laughs> okay? Jesus showing them, not, not showing them things from the word that has nothing to do with him. No, no, showing them that Christ must come and suffer and be killed and rise again from the dead. And they... Uh, they didn't get it. Then they got it because Jesus opened their eyes when they were having fellowship, when they were having communion. They went back to the disciples. They said, oh yeah, we heard this and you know, he appeared to Peter and uh, uh, Now, Jesus told the women to tell the disciples, go to the mountain, the mountain in Galilee, and uh, I'll meet you there. And this part in Matthew, he's saying, so they went to Galilee, they went to the mountain. Great obedience, yeah? And they saw him, he appeared to them. And they said, wow. And they worshipped him. Proper worship. Prostrate yourself. The word is proskoneo. Prostrate yourself. To kiss someone's feet or hand. And yet, Matthew is saying, and some doubt it. Now notice this. He is not saying that some worshipped him and some didn't worship and doubt it. No, no, no. And they, all of them, worshipped him. But some of those who worshipped, some of those who obeyed and went to the mountain and worshipped him doubted. After Jesus appearing to the women, to Mary Magdalene, to Peter, to came to through to the room and ate with them, and to the two guys on the road to Emmaus, and they are seeing him here and now on the mountain. 
like Peter, James, and John. And his form was transformed and he was beaming with light, not even reflecting, shining with light, all of that. And still they didn't get it. My first point is we live in a tug of war between faith and unbelief. Every day of your life. Don't think that because you stood up once and you prayed the, you know, what they call the salvation prayer and you don't have unbelief. These were the disciples. Do you think they believed already? They performed miracles in Jesus' name. Do you think they believed in Jesus' name? They cast out demons in Jesus' name. Do you think they believed in Jesus' name? And yet, the father of that boy came to them with his son and they couldn't cast out the demon. And Jesus told them, it's because of your unbelief. You can have faith and yet harbor unbelief. Okay? Let me explain this. You can still have faith. You believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He rose from the dead. And He is your Savior. And only by His blood, your sins are forgiven. And that you have access to be a child of God. And you're granted mercy. And yet, you have unbelief. You come one day and you don't act according to the truth. You don't live according to the truth. You don't feel according to the truth. You would even do something like going to the mountain and worship but with doubt. You still harbor doubt. It looks like he's risen from the dead. But what if, what if? What if this hallucination? Delusional? Maybe I'm delusional. Maybe you are. Maybe you were all delusional. Which is strange. But anyway. Maybe this won't continue. Maybe it worked yesterday, but... Would it work every day? Yes, yes, yes. God provided for me. God provided for me. I know. I prayed. And God provided for me. But does that mean that he will provide for me again? Maybe he provided for me because I was good. I'm not sure I'm good now. Maybe because I was obedient and I was a good boy. Or I, I, I paid my tithe. I did my dues. Maybe now I'm lacking in something. Would he? Would he still? Okay, so what about, I? you know, I, I, I prayed. I prayed and I really believed, but nothing happened. So I'm not sure. Will it happen? Because I, I, I didn't feel any change. You can have faith and yet harbor unbelief. You can have faith, and now you know that Jesus kind of, well, rose again. There is this strange thing. He appeared to us several times. He even, he even appeared to Thomas. When Thomas said, I won't believe until I see him with my own eyes, and I would shove my finger into his nail marks. And he did. Guess what he did? He appeared to him and, and even addressed Thomas on his own and told him, hey, mate, come, come. Put, put your hand here on my side. But then you get, you get overcome by life situations, uh, pressures, even needs. So you say, I'm going fishing. And nine of them or seven of them, whatever, went fishing. This is their profession. A lot of them are fishermen. And they didn't catch anything. And Jesus goes to them, walks to them, and asks them, have you got any meat? None. Just, just throw the net to the other side. And yet when they came out, he was already preparing breakfast for them. 
including meat. Tevin was so kind, he said, you bring from what you caught, as if they caught on their own. <laughs> we can believe and yet harbor unbelief. Here is the issue about faith and unbelief. These are two forces. Remember, I told you, a tug of war. And, and one is holding this side, one is holding that side, and they are pulling. If I allow both to work, I'm standing still. You know, Paul talked about this in different words. and He said, so, so the spirit warfares against the flesh, and the flesh against the spirit. Okay? You can be in faith and in the spirit, and you can be harboring unbelief, and you will be in the flesh. And then you would do the things that you don't want to do spiritually. But as well, if you are in the spirit and you're living by faith, you would do the things that your flesh wants, and you are able to refuse by the power of God. See, Jesus was talking to them and allowed them all to worship him and told all of them, including the some who doubted, all authority was given to me. Go. Go and disciple. He didn't say, oh, uh, you, Mike, no, come this way. Dan, yeah. Okay, so you go and make disciples. You who doubt it, uh, no. When Paul, when Peter couldn't love Jesus back the way he is asking, you know, would you love me wholeheartedly, sacrificially? Like, would you put and lay everything for me, Peter? That's the meaning of the word agape. Would you love me? Do you love me, Peter? And Peter had several encounters with Jesus by then, and, and he learned a lesson about himself. And he was more self-aware. He said, the thing is, you know, the thing is, as you know, so I love you, but not the kind of love you're talking about. The great thing about Jesus is he didn't tell him, oh, so you g get lost. He still told him, feed my sheep. Shepherd my flock. Because it doesn't depend on you, Peter. You can have faith and still harbor unbelief. And that's because of what you give your ears, your eyes, your heart, your will to. Eve in Genesis experienced God. She saw God. She is living in the goodness of God. She was created by God. Do you think she believed? See, God would walk like in the afternoon with them. Do you think she believed? Yeah, yeah, she had faith. And yet, because she gave her ear to the serpent, because she started entertaining a rhetoric that is not God's word, and she started looking according to that rhetoric, the text says that she looked at the fruit and it was amazing, really yummy to eat. So she gave her ear, she gave her eyes, and then she thought, oh, the amazing thing, I will be like God and I will know what is good what is bad, what is good, what is evil, and I will decide. I, don't need, I won't be in need of anyone. I'll have it all, and I'll be self-sufficient. 
so she, her, her obedience went that way, towards the serpent, instead of God's way. And her will acted, and she started reaching out, getting the fruit, plucking it, looking at it, and eating it. You can harbor unbelief, though you believe in God, because you gave your ear, your eyes, your obedience, maybe all of them together, your will, to something else or someone else which is more important. Living by faith is not an ideology or certain mantras that you repeat. Living by faith is sticking to the person of Jesus Christ and seeing the world through him and understanding the world through what he is saying and his ways, his thoughts, every day in every thing. That's, that's walking in the Spirit. If you're asking what walking in the Spirit is, living in the Spirit is, that's living in the Spirit. You don't have a set of uh, routines or ideas that you are sticking to. No. You have a person. Christianity is not really a religion. Christianity is Christ. Christ. Knowing him every day. While I'm eating food, yes. While I'm not eating food, yes, definitely. While I'm staying at home, when I'm going out, absolutely. When I'm working, yes. When I'm not working, definitely. When I'm with my kids, yes. When I'm with my wife, absolutely. When I'm on my own, definitely. When I'm in good times, yes. When I'm in bad times, yes. When I'm challenged, yes. When, I'm, when everything is nice and rosy and the sun is shining and all is easy, yes. And when you stop relating to him and knowing him, this is where you're open to harbor unbelief. Because your ears and your eyes would be given to someone else. Therefore, your will and your heart will be given to that. We all have failures. That's my second point. You will always fail. The, the, the disciples failed. The people of God, Israel, failed. You think you're better? On the contrary. The Bible is talking about these things because we are exactly the same. We're exactly the same. You have failed. Maybe you're failing even now. And you will. But your failures won't ever, ever stop or cancel God's faithfulness. Romans 3.3 3 says that our unfaithfulness will never change his faithfulness. Don't get stuck in your failures. Instead, admit them. See yourself as who you are. In Romans, at the end, he's saying, well, don't try and raise yourself above the level of faith that you have. You know, pretend. Okay? Look like. People like that because it works in normal society. I would come to you, like, talking, like, confidence and so on, and you think that I'm an amazing person. This is why I ask you, are you good? Yeah. Are you doing well? Yes. Amazing? Yes. Awesome. Oh, yes. Awesome. Really? Really, you're awesome and fabulous. and That, right away? I would sit with a group of people and say, oh, that was phenomenal. I was attending the same meeting. It couldn't be that phenomenal, really. I ate the same food. It wasn't that amazing. Because I cooked it, I know. <laughs> but we like to encourage ourselves with empty words. 
we like to see ourselves in a good light. We like to hide the things that we don't like in ourselves and dress them up, dress them up in a more uh, acceptable thing. So this is why you hear some really, really bad stuff like, you're perfect. Well, if you are perfect, and I'm perfect, can you tell me why the cross? Why did Jesus die? Why was he humiliated, beaten, his beard plucked, with a crown of thorns on his head, died, and rose again? Why? You're not perfect, and it's okay. It's okay, dear. You're not perfect. Actually, you're not even good enough. And there is nothing wrong with that. Jesus accepts you here and now as you are. And he has the solution of all what you're lacking. <laughs> and he has grace for all what you're struggling with. You are not perfect. And you are not even good enough. It would be great if we humble ourselves. Don't fear your failures. Don't let them define you. Because Jesus has come into this world and died for you and died and rose again. You don't have to hide like Adam and Eve from God. You don't have to cover yourself with the leaves of the tree. He, he knows where you are. He knows your condition. And he's allowing you to come to him so that he would cover you. Don't let your failures make you believe that that's it. There is no hope. Don't allow your failures to get you stuck in you trying to deal with your own issues. Depend on his faithfulness. Depend on his faithfulness. Depend on his love, his mercy, his grace. Look at this. Jesus kept talking to them about what will happen so that they wouldn't lose faith. But if you, allow, if you allow your failures to define you, you will be a Judas, not a Peter. Both messed up big time. All disciples ran away from Jesus. But the one who got really hit by his betrayal and got stuck in himself, was so self-centered, killed himself. If you accept your failures, become honest about your issues and mistakes and weaknesses, you get to see Jesus, and you get to be saved, and you get to be reinstated, and you get to live an amazing life like Peter and John and James. Don't get stuck in your failures, because your failures would never stop God's faithfulness and would never cancel God's faithfulness. God will always be faithful. My third and last point. We are so wired, programmed to live a self-centered life. But Jesus came and died for us and rose again so that we won't live a self-centered life, but we live a Christ-centered life. Self-centered life, you rely on your own power, your own wisdom, your own strength, your own uh, logic. What you see, how you reason, what you've learned, what you heard, okay? And how you feel. Of course, feelings are the most important things. Ah, okay? It's not, by the way. Just tell you. Your feelings are not the most important thing. Okay? Your feelings are not truth. Okay, feelings go up and down all the time. Yes. And they are subjective and not necessarily at all objective. Okay, God cares for your feelings, yes. But your feelings doesn't define anything. If you live according to how you see life, how you how you rationalize things, what you've heard from people, 
how you feel and your own strength and will, you will always harbor unbelief. And actually, you might be totally stuck in unbelief and working out of unbelief. But if you choose what God has for you and what Jesus paid the price for, you believe in it, you will start living out of faith and in the Spirit, from the Spirit. And therefore, you will not be stuck in your desires, in your thinking, in your worldview. You won't be stuck in failures because Jesus made a way for us all. My testimony about God is that he is the kindest, the kindest person and the most faithful person I've ever met. I failed him many, many times. Most probably more than all of you. And he always, always stayed faithful. It's not that I fall into the miry bog that uh, Carl was talking about. No, no, no. Like I, I dive in repeatedly. And he comes repeatedly and stretch out his hand and pull me out and put me on a rock, cleanse me, speak to me, and put a new song. I live a certain life, and God has provided for us many times in amazing ways. And yet, sometimes I am against a certain challenge or need, and I catch myself with unbelief. It is so embarrassing, I can't tell you, with what God has done in our lives. So embarrassing. It's a shame that I would treat him in such a dishonoring way. And yet it happens. But here is my experience. He never treated me according to my unbelief. He never treated me according to my unbelief. He was always faithful. He was always kind. All was good. And he would stretch his arm down and pull me, pull me out. Set my feet on a rock. Cleanse me. He tells me, don't worry, cheer up. I got you. You will get stronger. Just keep your eyes. Keep your ears. You see, you see, son, this is what you listen to. This is how you thought. This is what you harbored. This is why you acted out of unbelief. It's okay. I still love you the same. Still love you the same. Every time I focused my eyes, my ears, my heart, whether strength or devotion or my will, and I obeyed him, not just with one part of my life. I tried to be all there. You see, Jesus told the Samaritan woman that the Father is looking for those who would worship in spirit and in truth. Every time I gave him my heart and told him, I'm struggling, help me, I didn't end up in the mighty box. See, the father of that kid told him, Lord, I believe, I believe. Help my unbelief. I have a bit of faith. I know I have faith. This is why I came. I came and I presented my kid to your disciples. I believe. And I understand the principle that you're saying. All things are possible to those who believe. Yes. And yet, because you are the light of the world and everything is exposed before you. Help my unbelief because you see it. Help my unbelief. And Jesus freed that kid. 
if we go to God and confess our unbelief, instead of trying to make up something about what we're struggling with, dress it up or try to look better, if we go as we are, if we are honest with ourselves and God, okay, this is, this is fellowshipping with God. You see, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, their eyes were opened when they allowed Jesus in and they broke bread with him. That's fellowship, that's communion. Now, John, in the first epistle of John, first chapter, he's saying, well, only if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with God and one another. You see, fellowship, fellowship, okay? Now, what is walking in the light, John? And he's saying this, that when you commit sin, you confess it. When you are in unbelief, you confess it. You come as you are. You stay in the light. You don't hide. You don't try to say, no, 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 I didn't sin. No, 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 I don't have that issue. You come as you are. And when you come like that, Jesus forgives your sin, and his blood would purify us. Let's stand up. We want to encourage you to come as you are. With everything. All your weaknesses, all your failures, all your hurts, all your disappointments. And just tell him, here I am. Have your way with me. Help my unbelief. I don't want to stay as I am. And I don't want to make a solution for myself. I don't want to hide from you. And I, I don't want to cover up. I want just to be as I am. In your hands. You have your way. Have your way with me. I'll throw myself on you. For you are faithful. For you're always good. You will never deny yourself. You gave yourself freely to us. Tell him, help my unbelief. If I have words from the world that created unbelief, if I have experiences that I held on that created unbelief, if I'm seeing things, experiencing things, feeling things that are helping, seeding doubt in my heart, help my unbelief, help my unbelief. I have no strength maybe in myself or maybe I'm leaning too much on my own will and my own skill help my unbelief help my unbelief Lord teach me how to depend totally on you teach me how to rely totally on you teach me how to live a Christ centered life with my focus on you, my eyes on you my heart is for you. My strength is from you. My obedience to you. Where I'm focusing on you, Jesus, every day and in everything. 